thank you for joining us today, brothers and sisters. We are going to jump into John, the sixth chapter, uh, verses 64 through 66. Uh, I pray that something is said that encourages you and keeps you for the rest of the week. Enjoy our choir, and we pray again that this blesses you.
Welcome again, brothers and sisters. Let us jump into the word of God. And as we jump into the word of God, we'll go to the gospel of John. The gospel of John, the gospel of John, the sixth chapter. And we will read the 64th through the 66th verses. We'll read John, the sixth chapter, and we will read verses 64 through 66. I want you to read along with me, uh, and as you read along with me, remember that perhaps you may be reading a different version of the Bible because I am reading from the CEB, the Common English Bible, the Common English Bible. So brothers and sisters, as we read the Word of God, uh, let us pay attention. The 64th verse says it like this. Yet some of you, this is Jesus speaking, you don't believe. Jesus knew from the very beginning who wouldn't believe and the one who would betray him. Jesus said, for this reason, I said to you that none can come to me unless the father enables them to do so. At this, many of his disciples Many of those who followed Jesus, many of his disciples turned away and no longer accompanied Jesus. And just for a few minutes, brothers and sisters, as we face uh, this time and this tension and this season, uh, we want to use it as, as a theme today, let's follow Jesus. Let's follow Jesus. Jesus. Let's follow Jesus. And with that being said, brothers and sisters, before we talk about God's word, let us consult with God. God, in Jesus' name, we thank you for this opportunity to speak to your people. God, we thank you for the opportunity to speak to unbelievers through this platform. God, we pray that this platform and this time that we have before uh, people is not mishandled or this time is not a miscarriage of faith and uh, belief and justice. God, in the name of Jesus, we pray uh, that let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in thy sight, O Lord, my strength, our strength, my redeemer, our redeemer. Let us all say amen, amen. Brothers and sisters, let's follow, follow Jesus. Let's follow Jesus. And for those of you who don't know, Jesus was a radical and Jesus was one who fought for justice. And brothers and sisters, understand this, that we are in a time uh, where there are many distractions. We are living in a time where um, we are bombarded with many distractions. There are distractions on our phones. Perhaps we get notifications, we get emails, we, uh, we get text messages, we look, turn on the TV, we see CNN, we see this clown, and uh, we see many other things that get our attention. But brothers and sisters, one of the things that we must do is keep our mind and keep our hearts and keep our energies focused on Jesus Christ. And Jesus Christ sought justice. Brothers and sisters, as we stop at the porch of our passage in the sixth chapter of John, these 71 verses describe Jesus uh, as Jesus was being followed by a multitude of what the scripture describes as disciples. He was sharing with them the requirements of redemption. He was sharing with them the specifications of salvation. And at the beginning of the text, the crowd assembled and Jesus performed a miracle by feeding thousands from a small lad's limited lunchbox. And we know that Jesus is able to do that.
by providing for those of us who are limited. And I want to pause parenthetically to say that Jesus can create unlimited provisions with unbelievably limited possessions. In other words, God can provide for you out of the crumbs of the table. God can provide for you, brothers and sisters, when you think that there are no provisions to be made, God can make a lot out of a little bit. You see uh, that in the text uh, where he had two fish and five loaves of bread. And what a performance, a performance by our Savior. But as the story unfolds, we find that these people really were not followers of Jesus Christ, but what it looks like uh, from the outset that they were fans of Jesus. Let me say that again. They were not followers at all, but what it looks like, uh, it seems like they were fans of our Lord. So for Jesus explained to them that the life of a disciple is one of practice and not merely performance. Brothers and sisters, our life is more so practice and not what we proclaim. Our life should be more of what we practice than what we proclaim. And I know we like the performance, but we must embrace and become more familiar with the practice of being a believer. Yet we discover that many of these people uh, uh, brothers and sisters, we must understand that many of these people, they just like to come to see a show and they did not really want to follow Jesus uh, no matter what the cost was. Therefore, when you make the decision, brothers and sisters, to follow Jesus, there are a few things that this text attempts to teach us. First of all, We've got to have, number one, when we decide to follow Jesus, we've got to have the proper motive. You've got to have the proper motive. When you decide to follow Jesus, you've got to have the proper motive. The text says that Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, you seek me. Not because you saw, uh, you, you seek me, not because you saw miracles, but because you did eat of the loaves and you were filled. In other words, you come looking for me, not because you saw God in my actions, but because I fed you. Brothers and sisters, what Jesus was saying is that he knew that they came looking for him not because of who he was, but what he had to offer. And what he had to offer is with substance that filled their stomachs and not substance that filled their souls. And brothers and sisters, and for uh, the disciples, they were they were they were impressed that uh, they were impressed that so many people stayed through a storm to seek the master. But Jesus was not impressed just because they sat through a storm, because he knows the human heart. He knew that people originally followed him because of his miracles. You find that in John 6 and 2. But now their motive was only to get a meal and be amused. What do you follow Jesus for? What do you log on to Pleasant Green's platform for? What do you engage ministry for? Do you engage ministry with a heart to serve or to propagate the kingdom of God, to bring God's kingdom to come. What do you serve God for? Do you serve God?
God with the right intentions or do you have an underlying motive to be seen? Brothers and sisters, when you decide to follow Jesus, you have to follow Jesus and you have to follow him with the right intentions and the proper motive. Jesus revealed that they had shallow and carnal motives. You see, sometimes people do the right things with the wrong motives. Uh, sometimes people give to the poor uh, so uh, that they can promote and prop up their own reputation. Sometimes people do right things with the wrong motives. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 6, 3 through 4, but when you give to the poor, don't let your right hand know what uh, your left hand is doing so that your giving may be done in secret and your father who sees in secret will reward you openly. Sometimes we can do the right thing with wrong motives. So people, uh, brothers and sisters, pray to exercise. Some people, some people pray, brothers and sisters, to exercise their proficiency in the English language. Some, some people pray just to be seen. But brothers and sisters, what the text is suggesting to us is that we ought not to pray or we ought not to do things just for a theatrical production. All these people were making a regular show out of their prayers. They were hoping for someone to recognize them. But one of our uh, one of the things that uh, the uh, old saints used to say, the, the seasoned saints, they, they used to say something like this. You ought to find yourself a secret closet, a quiet, secluded place, and you ought to pray so that you won't be tempted to role play before God. They were looking they were looking, they were looking, brothers and sisters, the right way for the wrong thing. And when you're looking the right way for the wrong thing, you will do things that are, that seem to be right, but brothers and sisters, they have the wrong intention. Pope John Paul II says, in the fulfillment of your duties, let your intentions be so pure that you reject from your actions any other motive than the glory of God and the salvation of souls. I challenge you that when you want or when you desire to do some religious thing, you ought to stand yourself up in the mirror of chastisement and ask, why am I doing this particular thing? Am I doing this for the glory of God or am I doing this because I want to be seen? Brothers and sisters, we've got to have the proper motive. Jesus understood human nature and he reminds us to not let our desires lead us into compromising our relationship with God. Never allow your desire to compromise your relationship with God. When you possess a proper motive, when brothers and sisters, when you possess a proper motive, you will lead a proper pursuit. And when you are properly pursuing God, God will bless you. When you have the right motive, you will begin to earnestly and diligently seek God. Hebrews 11 and 6 says, he who comes, he or she for that matter, brothers and sisters, uh, who comes uh, to God must believe that God is and that God is a rewarder 
of those who diligently, earnestly, and rightly intended seek God. Brothers and sisters, when you earnestly seek God, when you earnestly follow God's direction, when you follow God because you want to be close to God, God is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Many people want success, but brothers and sisters, we lack sacrifice. Number one, we've also we've got to understand uh, that we've got to have the proper motive. And next, we've got to understand that what the text is explaining to us is that we've got to have a provocative faith. You've got to have a provocative faith. Jesus told his disciples something mind-blowing. He told them something provocative. It shook many of their faiths. Brothers and sisters, in the 35th verse of our text, Jesus says, I am the bread of life. Whomever comes to me shall never hunger. Whoever that believeth on me shall never thirst. His message became even more provocative as he pushed further and he says, except you eat of my flesh, the son of man, and drink of my blood, you will not have life. Jesus pushed their faith to the limit as he indicated that you've got to partake in me. And he said that you've got to drink of my blood and eat of my flesh. And then, and only then, you will become a part of me. Brothers and sisters, at that particular time, that was provocative faith. He was pushing their limits. Provocative faith is being cognitively open and aware and spiritually available to accepting the many different and innumerable ways that God can work in our lives and on our behalf. In other words, brothers and sisters, provocative faith means that your faith lives outside of the box that you desire to put God in. In other words, brothers and sisters, you've got to understand that God works in mysterious ways. He may not work when you want him to work, but when he works, he does a masterpiece. Provocative faith. Provocative faith. Provocative faith does some things. Provocative faith is standing on a cliff at the Red Sea with thousands of gallons of sea in front of you and an evil pharaoh behind you, an enormous Egyptian army in pursuit of you and still making the first step believing that God will make a way. Brothers and sisters, that is provocative faith. Provocative faith is being blind, broke, and begging on the side of the road and told to be quiet but you just had uh, an epiphany that Jesus Christ is in the neighborhood. Jesus Christ is in the area. So you lift up your voice. You said, thou son of David, have mercy upon me. In other words, you lifting up your voice. Perhaps you may be saying, and in that same text, they were telling him to be quiet when he lifted up his voice. There are some folks that are telling you to be quiet when you say black lives matter. Keep on lifting your voice. Keep on following Jesus because Jesus was a radical and Jesus Jesus, Jesus tried to get us to have a provocative faith. A provocative faith means uh, that we trust Jesus Christ outside of the box. Here Jesus is making an explicit messianic claim. And I'm almost done. You've got to go 
for you've got to have Christ in you. You've got to partake in his suffering. You've got to partake in his death. And it's only after you partake in his suffering and only after you partake in his death will you be able to partake and appreciate his resurrection. Brothers and sisters, it's only after you've had some heartache. It's only after you've had some pain. It's only after you have participate, participated in Jesus' suffering and in Jesus' death that you can participate in the resurrection. Enduring death to get to life is provocative. <laughs> we don't want to do that. But what I share with you is that enduring death, enduring death to get to life, that is a provocative thing. And this claim is pushing us and pushing you and I to understand that we must know and recognize to have faith in Jesus Christ takes you beyond our human restrictions. When you have faith in Jesus Christ, it moves us beyond our human restrictions. To trust in the power of Christ is to transcend or go beyond human limitations. Brothers and sisters, what I share with you is that the Lord is able to help us overcome our limitations. I, I know, I know, I know that many of us, we, we're ready to log off today and we're ready to go about our uh, day, our, our lives. But there's one more thing I share with you after we understand, brothers and sisters, uh, that there must be a proper motive when you follow Jesus. There must be a provocative faith when you follow Jesus and then there also must be a persistent conviction. There must be a persistent conviction. The text says that others turned around. The text says in the final verse of our text, from that time, many of his disciples went back and followed no more with him. It is what I share with you, brothers and sisters, it is the quality of convictions that determines our success and not the number of followers. Jesus even asked the final 12, do you want to turn around to? After all, and after all they'd heard, and after all they had seen that Jesus had done for them, they started to turn around. And I want you to understand this. Sometimes to have provocative faith is to do things that, uh, that are not ordinarily done. To have provocative faith is to trust Jesus in a season that is unprecedented. There's history that surrounds even this time. Brothers and sisters, the civil rights movement, there was a song that said, I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. I ain't going to let nobody turn me around. I'm going to keep on walking. I'm going to keep on talking. and I'm going to keep on marching up freedom's highway. And I want to encourage uh, police. I want to encourage protesters as well. Keep on doing what God has convicted you to do because we're going to keep on walking and we're going to keep on talking and we're going to keep on protesting up the King's Highway. Brothers and sisters, you've got to have a persistent conviction. You've got to know that you know that you know that Jesus is standing with you even though everyone is turning around. Brothers and sisters, we pray that this word has strengthened you, and I pray that this was an encouragement to, to you. 
Uh, so at this point, brothers and sisters, we open up the door of the church. We open up the door of the church. Uh, if you'd like to be a part of Pleasant Green Missionary Baptist Church, you can email us uh, to ghpruitt uh, at gmail.com. Uh, and we will respond to you within 48 hours if you'd like to be a member of the church. We thank God for all of our visitors and all of our guests who have logged on. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. Thank God for you. Also, brothers and sisters, we bless God for those of you who are faithful in your financial giving. Thank you for being faithful. Those of you all who want to continue be being faithful, you can write a check or a money order uh, to 1220 G.H. Pruitt Place, uh, St. Louis, Missouri, 63113. Amen, amen, amen. And also, if you would like to give, you can give online and you can go to www.pgmbcstl.org uh, uh, and you can give online click on our giving slot. Brothers and sisters, we have been encouraged by your faithfulness. Thank you, and we are praying for you. And brothers and sisters, this has been an awesome time, and I pray uh, that something was said again uh, that has been an uplift to your heart. We want to pause now uh, to give the benediction uh, over you and over your families. Uh, during this time, uh, this COVID season and this season of uh, uprising and protest, uh, we want to pray. God, we thank you for being God and we thank you for being God uh, all by yourself. God, we pray uh, that we can get to a place where we have uh, where our priorities or, or are in the right place. And God, we Pray that we can get to a place where, uh, God, we uh, we seek you. And, God, we pray uh, that our faith is provocative. God, we ask that you uh, embrace this city, smile upon this city, uh, those who are protesters and those who are police and law enforcement. God, we ask that you have mercy upon them. God, we ask that you have mercy upon the pleasant parishioners and the pastors of this city. In Jesus' name we pray now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of God's glory with exceedingly joy uh, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory, majesty, dominion, and power both now and forever. May we all say, Amen.